what you'll hear on Patreon. I think we're going to get major crises. I think the main capitalist countries are, are much weaker than they have been for a long time. So certainly they're they're as weak, becoming as weak now as they were in 1970 or in the mid 70s. Mid 70s is the last time they were in a major crisis, and they're approaching that weakness now. Well, I, I, I'm Paul Cockshot. I am now retired, but I trained originally as an economist, um, heavily influenced by Marxist econ economics, which rather than being taught as a student, we economic students in Manchester University in the 70s organized our self study programs in Marxist economics. Um, I later, in order to be able to analyze economic statistics, got a degree in computing because I wanted to be able to carry out a concrete analysis of the conjuncture through which British capitalism was going in the 1970s. And that required processing a lot of economic statistics. I initially tried working on that using a pocket calculator, which I borrowed from a richer Greek student because in those days, even pocket calculators were out of the reach of British students um, and realized this was too time consuming. So I got a degree in computing. Uh, I later went and worked as a computer designer in various companies and later as a, a lecturer in um, computer science, did research in databases, 3D television, um, database machines, programming languages. Um, the, that's probably about, about the range of areas. And in the process, started in the late 1980s to move back to an interest in economics because of what was happening in the Soviet Union. And the crisis in the Soviet Union, which it struck me at the time, would be solvable using modern computing technology. Um, and in particular, I was influenced by reading a book by a guy called Alec Nove, who was a professor of, I think he was professor of Soviet studies rather than economics at Glasgow University, uh, called The Economics of Feasible Socialism. Towards a New Socialism, Cockshot and Cottrell, 1993, page 47. The Problem of Scale. In his book, The Economics of Feasible Socialism, 1983, Alec Nove emphasized the importance of the sheer scale of modern economies. He said that the Soviet economy included some 12 million distinct types of product, and quoted the estimate of one O. Antonov that to draw up a complete and balanced plan for the Ukraine would take the labor of the whole world's population over a 10 million year period. The same argument may apply to computing labor values. It is one thing to solve the equations for our toy example of an input-output table. It would be quite a different thing to solve a system of 12 million simultaneous equations. But it is not enough just to say that calculating labor values for a large economy is complex. We have to know how complex it is. The estimate quoted by Nove gives an impression of vast and unmanageable complexity and seems to close off the question from further discussion. We should point out that Nove is by no means alone in making this sort of claim. Such arguments are quite routine amongst opponents of socialism. We cite Nove in order to show that even left-leaning economists tend to throw up their hands at the complexity of socialist planning. But what we need is an account of the laws which govern how long it takes to compute labor values for economies of different degrees of complexity. Редактор
And he was actually very influential on Neil Kinnock. Um, and I listened to Neil Kinnock give a speech in Scotland just after Neil Kinnock became leader of the Labour Party. In fact, Neil Kinnock had that day lost his voice, so he got Robin Cook to read the speech. But what struck me about it was that Neil Kinnock was using Alec Nove's book as a justification for essentially tearing up any commitment to Clause 4 of the Labour Party. He was using Nove, who was actually arguing really a sort of Harold Wilson-type social democratic position against the Soviet Union. Kinnock was using it to move one stage further to the right and repudiate Atlee Wilson-type social democracy. Uh, in favor of concessions to um, Thatcherism. And where did I hear this? I heard it at the John McIntosh Memorial Lecture, which takes place each year in Scotland. Democratic Socialism and Social Democracy, text of Neil Kinnock's speech delivered in June 1983. The first step in creatively developing an ideology and strategy of democratic socialism is the recognition that every socialist movement exhibits not only flaws of caution and complacency and conservatism in the analysis on the right, but seductive, superficially radical, but ultimately destructive and reactionary tactics and strategy on the ultra-left. Modern social democracy has been proved wrong, not only in its economic premise, but also in the political assumptions based on it. We owe ourselves and those who gave us democratic socialism better than that. We owe the people of today better than that. And by reason and radicalism, through the very common sense of socialism, we can work with them and for them to rescue and revive our country and fulfill obligations to the wanting of the world. Social democracy cannot do that. Ancient and modern conservatism does not want to do that. That can only be done by democratic socialism, an iron Bevan's child of modern society that seeks the truth in any given situation, knowing all the time that if this be pushed too far, it falls into error, that struggles against the evils that flow from private property, yet realizes that all forms of private property are not necessarily evil, that knows how to enjoy the struggle whilst recognizing that progress is not the elimination of struggle, but rather a change in its terms. We shall enjoy the struggle and we shall win. And either the previous or the next year, the lecture was given by the leader of the New Zealand Labour Party. He essentially tore up any commitment in the Labour Party in New Zealand to the welfare state and explicitly adopted neoliberalism as a doctrine of the New Zealand Labour Party. And I thought this is, this is all very dangerous politically. Um, it reinforces Margaret Thatcher's idea that there is no alternative. Okay. And one had, therefore, to say there is an alternative and to do it by systematically deconstructing the arguments that Nove had put forward. And to say, the Soviet Union has problems, but they're not problems that can be solved by the market. They're problems that can be solved by computer technology, the application of classical political economy, Marxian political economy, not neoliberal. This is something that I have sort of put all of my hopes into myself, where I have kind of mourned the Soviet Union. I'm not saying that it was a perfect system or something, but it is our attempt, you know, as human beings to overcome some, you know, to completely overturn an entire economic system. And I often thought, if only we had had computing technology, then, you know, it, it might not have ended the way that it did. I said that to Rick Kuhn years ago. <laughs> You know, a critic might say that, well, the USSR kind of tried to do that and it was this horrible failure. Um, they were using like production prices that they stole from capitalists to figure out how much something should cost and so on. So how would we 
get over that? Is it a matter of if the USSR just had the internet, <laughs> all would be well? I think that workers did take power in Russia in 1917, and they did so through a revolution that placed hands in extremely democratic institutions, vastly more democratic institutions than uh, those of bourgeois parliamentary democracy uh, that uh, you and I enjoy. And those institutions were called Soviets, which are workers' councils. That occurred in a relatively backward capitalist country. And it was, and the revolution was led by the Bolsheviks as a kind of a wager. And this was a wager that Stalin, at one stage, himself acknowledged. And it was a wager that the revolution could spread from relatively backward Russia, where maybe 5% of the population were workers and the vast bulk were peasants. The wager was that the revolution would spread to far more developed capitalist countries, mm -hmm. in particular Germany. Uh, and this was something that wasn't a, a ridiculous idea because what ended the First World War was revolutions in Central Europe. There was revolution in Germany and from 1918 until 1923, uh, the political situation in Germany was extremely unstable uh, and there were a number of occasions when revolution seemed to be possible for a number of reasons, including uh, the misleadership of the Communist International by those uh, who came to lead it. That potential was not realised in uh, Germany. And likewise, somewhat later on, uh, where revolution broke out in China in 1926-1927, uh, the misleadership of the Communist International played an important role in the defeat of workers' power in, in China as well. What I'd argue is that the, the, and this is essentially a Trotskyist argument, that the isolation of the Russian Revolution doomed it to failure. Mm -hmm. That that isolation was not something preordained. It was something that was um, a consequence of the defeat of workers' struggles uh, in a series of different countries. So by the end of the 1920s, there were no vestiges of workers' power at all. The counter-revolution had been successful. Its figurehead and dictator was Stalin. Adding the internet to Stalin does not equal socialism <laughs> because socialism is not possible without workers' power, without workers' democracy, without control by the working class. Socialism, socialist revolution is a self-emancipation of the working class and that self-emancipation uh, can only be sustained, that emancipation can only be sustained and working class rule can only be a reality if there are democratic institutions through which the will of the working class can be articulated. A dictatorship cannot do that. So, yeah, it wouldn't have been okay if we'd had the internet in 1928 when the first five-year plan uh, was formulated. Would it make a difference now? I think it makes planning on any kind of a level, including a global level, a much more straightforward proposition, not only the internet, but also the kind of computing power that we have today uh, would make democratic planning, not arbitrary decision-making imposed by coercion from above, which was what the Soviet five-year plans were about, and therefore, because they were imposed from above, they couldn't really be planning because nobody really knew uh, the capacities of different enterprises and the uh, productive abilities of workers because it was in everybody's interests to conceal that. Today, making the calculations to coordinate productive activity across continent, well, countries, continents, internationally, is far more straightforward than it would have been if the Russian Revolution had to, had spread across <laughs> Europe and then skipped the Atlantic. What do you say 
to people who think that the, the problems were a lot deeper than a technological fix could really it, get to. It is certainly not reducible to technology. Um, technology makes things possible that couldn't be done without the technology, but it's not a sufficient condition. Um, the There are serious political conditions as well. And basically, these political conditions, they're actually very complicated. And they relate partly to democracy. But when I say democracy, I don't mean voting and competition between political parties. I mean democracy in the sense that Aristotle meant it which is essentially ruled by the poor. That's what Aristotle says democracy is. In fact, Aristotle's definition of democracy is not far off. Um, what taking, what um, Marx said using Latin terminology the dictatorship of the proletariat. He's using Roman analogies there. But if you take uh, what Aristotle says in the Athenian constitution and in the politics, he says what's characteristic of a democracy is that you have rule by those who are poor or those who derive their living from the mechanical arts, i.e. workers by hand. And the, the way this is in, ensured is by having the selection of all representatives by lot so that the upper classes can't control the representational system. And that if you, he, he says, where you have elections, you've always actually got an aristocratic state because elections are based on the principle of selecting the best the Aristos. And when you elect people, the, the class operation comes, sorry, class system comes into operation and the people who appear the best are the best educated, who have had training in rhetoric, um, who have the connections, etc. So you see, wherever you have an electoral system, the class composition of the government formed is totally different from the class composition of the population. The only way that the USSR was able to offset that was by the fact that during the Brezhnev period, they set quotas for candidates to ensure the, quota, the class composition of the candidates put forward by the Co Communist Party reflected the class composition of society. Now, that's a less effective method than um, random selection. Uh, so, and it's obviously not favored by a party bureaucracy because it disenfranchises them in particular as against the mass of the people. But whilst the former party dictatorship which existed in the Soviet Union was very effective in a revolutionary situation. And in the first generation or two after it, it turns into its opposite in due course. So that once you had Gorbachev's generation coming forward, you had people for whom being in the party was a career, not be people drawn from the original class background that existed in the previous generations and people like Brezhnev came from a different class background. The, these people that made their way into it represented the political influence of the intelligentsia. Uh, and the intelligentsia actually stood to gain from a restoration of capitalism. 
Angus Deaton got the Nobel Prize for economics, and he's a British economist who went over to the States. And his remarkable work is to demonstrate that life expectancy among working class white Americans has been declining. And this decline in life expectancy is practically unprecedented in his developed country. Now, he shows very clearly that whilst living conditions and life expectancy for working class Americans have declined, for those with college degrees, this hasn't occurred. Now, a paper in the British medical journal in the 1980s, I, would, I, I can't remember it offhand, um, by two surgeons from Leningrad, showed very similar results, that in the 1990s, the was a rapid, everyone knows, there was a rapid increase in mortality in Russia. Um, what they demonstrate is that this dem increase in mortality occurred among manual workers and collective farmers or ex-collective farmers, but didn't occur among the intelligentsia. The reason is that a shift to a market economy relatively favored the intelligentsia. Many of them lost out as well, but their losses were nothing like as severe as those which affected people with manual jobs. Because in the Soviet Union, there'd been a systematic bias towards paying people who did heavy physical labor well compared to people who did um, what was in physical terms light work. And this therefore was beneficial to manual workers and detrimental to the intelligentsia. And therefore, if you get a shift politically towards the representative bodies in the Soviet Union being made up of the intelligentsia rather than manual workers, you have a class which would benefit relatively from moving to a market economy, starting to control the levers of power. And this occurred as soon as, as soon as Gorbachev allowed contested elections to the Supreme Soviet. The class composition and the sex composition changed got more men, you got more professionally educated men and a sharp reduction in manual workers and farmers. You then had a, a Supreme Soviet that was oriented towards supporting the restoration of a market economy. Now, this then generates a whole series of crises. It generates um, crises because Gorbachev attempts to end the level of alcohol consumption, okay? Reduces the planned production of alcohol. However, alcohol taxes had been a major source of state revenue. If you remove the, the alcohol sales, very little alcohol tax is collected. You then have a state budget deficit. State budget deficits then covered by printing rubles. You get a lot, you get inflation or hidden inflation. You get that immediately generates shortages because there's suppressed excess demand. This undermines the political stability of the, the system and makes it look as if it's failing much more than it actually is. I mean, it's very, very striking to me in the 80s to go to Poland in the early 80s and see that there was no food, no meat in the meat shops. It was only after some days that I realized the shops 
with marble counters were butchers. Now, why was there no meat in the meat shops? Because the price of meat was far below what it was in Britain. So people could easily buy the meat as soon as it appeared. And it disappeared. And therefore, there's an apparent shortage of it. But if you look at the number of kilograms per head of meat that was being consumed in Poland in, say, this must have been 1981 or 82, this was way above the number of kilograms per head being consumed in Scotland. It was about 50 kilograms a head in Scotland per year and 80 kilograms a head in Poland. But there was no apparent shortage of meat in Scotland. That's because meat was expensive. I suppose a, a critic would say, well, that's according to the USSR's own accounting. No, these are UN figures. Indeed, that Polish um, big agricultural uh, output figures are wrong. I haven't seen anyone convincingly say that. I've never seen it, it allege that the figures were wrong. What was certainly the case, you only had to look at the prices, was that the prices were very low. And if you set the prices very low, you will get shortages. And this was another part of the the, the, the thing we argued in towards the new socialism. You have to actually set consumer prices according to the law of value. Socialism isn't a matter of subsidizing prices of consumer goods below the, the level of, the, of value. If you do that, you get immediately generate shortages, which can only be handled by rationing if you're, if you're going to have the prices low. So this might be a very stupid question, but doesn't the law of value already set prices? <laughs> Not if they are administered prices. You find both Stalin and Gorbachev making the same criticisms mm. that prices in the USSR were not following the law of value. What they mean was that they, the prices of certain goods, like bread, were set proportionately lower than the amount of labor required to produce them. It's when, when Soviet writers talk about the law of value, they're, they're vague, okay? They don't spell it out. But what it means was the relative price of essential foodstuffs was proportionately lower than the amount of labor required to produce them when compared to other goods. Now, why was this? It was because there were quite heavy taxes on a lot of consumer goods. There was essentially a value-added tax, very low income tax, low or negligible income tax. But what was called a turnover tax, which is essentially VAT. And the VAT was quite high, except for essentials. And essentials were actually subsidized. And a whole series of things were made free because they were paid for out of VAT. And this had a whole series of detrimental results because if you set the price of things below its true value, it's impossible to meet the level of demand that society puts forward for those goods with the productivity you actually have. Problem in Poland, you flew over Poland in those days and you saw half the country was made up of strip fields of the sort that we used to get told about in our textbooks used to exist in Britain in the Middle Ages. Tiny little strip fields operated by independent peasants. Other areas you flew over, which had probably 
been once part of East Prussia and had been converted into collective farms, had large farms. Now, you weren't going to get a high productivity of labor on the peasant strip farms. Therefore, in Poland, you had a constant contradiction between the interests of the peasantry and the interests of the working class. The, and the way the Polish governments, whether it's Gomolko, Gierek, etc., had tried to address this was to try and provide cheap food for workers, but peasant agriculture couldn't produce large quantities of cheap food, which meant the country had to borrow money. Mm. So they got into debt to the West. Now, the whole thing, essentially, in, in the Polish case, dated back to 1956 when Gomulka reversed collectivization. It's the only way you would have got um, high productivity of agriculture was by having large machine-operated fields. Politically, they gave in to the peasant opposition to it, and therefore they were in a trap. And the Polish example is very critical because Poland was a spearhead of counter-revolution in Eastern Europe. And that stemmed originally from Gomolka's concessions in 1956, which led to repeated economic crises. They led to repeated working class discontent at food shortages. And the food shortages were masked by low prices, but were unresolvable so long as they had peasant agriculture. I'm visiting um, Bulgaria at the same time. The Bulgarians were very skeptical of the Poles, said, I mean, the Poles are in a mess because they don't have collectivized agriculture. And if you went to shops in Bulgaria, they were full of food, okay? Hmm. Masses of stuff. They had so much food that you, they, they seemed to be practically throwing it away. Uh, and the, you, you looked at the build of the Bulgarians. I mean, the men were built like brick shit houses. The, hmm. the, the, they were obviously on a high-protein diet. Hmm. Uh, and that was because they had high levels of, of collectivization and what they called agro-industrial complexes, which were very efficient at producing lots of food. Now, if the whole of the Eastern Europe was run like Bulgaria, the crisis, successive crises which led to um, Soldanos coming to power in Poland wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. But the Soldanos problems were caused by governments giving concessions, which they tried to resolve by having low prices. And those low prices were being subsidized out, in the Polish case, out of borrowing, in the Soviet case, out of VAT, which is a regressive form of tax. Mm -hmm which Marx always spoke against, that form of tax. So we were saying it, it, you had to have taxes on income. You had to have very egalitarian incomes, taxes on income, goods sold at their labor value, at which point you, there's no need to subsidize tax. Subsidies are only necessary if wages are low. And why were late wages low? Because the firms were paying a lot of VAT. Mm. The state enterprises had to pay the turnover tax. Therefore, they, they could only afford low wages. Therefore, the state had to subsidize a lot of goods because the wages were low. And it was a, a self-reproducing cycle based on a failure to apply um, 
what is essentially classical Marxist economics. So essentially the problems were numerous. There was a democratic deficit, if I understood you correctly, Um, a number of economic mistakes um, and missteps. Um, And I suppose the idea is that we could overcome this now with the knowledge that we have available to us and the technology available to us. You, you can overcome it with the technology, but you also need the correct political economy. Without a correct political economy, you can't have any revolutionary politics. So you wonder why, why did Marx spend the latter part of his life toiling in the, the British Museum library rather than writing just political polemics? It's because unless you get the political economy right, you can't work out how to change society. I have a tendency to think that what comes next already exists, that this is why Marx spends his entire life trying to understand capitalism and its movement, and why some of my favorite thinkers, including you know, Rubin, for instance, spend so much of his time understanding the transition from feudalism to capitalism. But it's, it's an understanding what came before, how one thing transitions into another, um, that we understand kind of the possibilities that are available to us. We don't just destroy the world and build a new one entirely in its place. So is there anything that you see in the world now that gives us the best indication of what might lead us to a different, perhaps better kind of future? Well, it's it's not necessarily the case that there is going to be a better kind of future. Oh, no, I know. I know. That's why I said what might lead us perhaps to a better, because there are all sorts of things that are leading us to terrible places. But is there a shoot of hope? (laughs) Well, it's a very big question. There are certain factors to do with the environmental crisis, which make some form of planning in kind an objective necessity for society. But the fact that something is a necessity for society merely says that in order for society to survive, this planning has to be put in place. Capital Volume 3 by Karl Marx, page 366. If it is said that overproduction is only relative, this is completely correct. But the whole capitalist mode of production is precisely such a relative mode of production, whose barriers are not absolute, but only absolute for it, on its basis. How else could there be a lack of demand for those very goods that the mass of the people are short of? And how could it be that this demand has to be sought abroad, in distant markets, in order to pay the workers back home the average measure of the necessary means of subsistence? In short, all the objections raised against the obvious phenomena of overproduction phenomena that remain quite impervious to these objections, amount to saying that the barriers to capitalist production are not barriers to production in general, and are therefore also not barriers to the specific capitalist mode of production. But the contradiction in this capitalist mode of production consists precisely in its tendency towards the absolute development of productive forces that come into continuous conflict with the specific conditions of production in which capital moves and can alone move. It is not that too many means of subsistence are produced in relation to the existing population. On the contrary, too little is produced to satisfy the mass of the population in an adequate and humane way. Nor are too many means of production produced to employ the potential working population. On the contrary, what is produced is firstly too great a section of the population which is in fact incapable of work, which owing to its situation is dependent on the exploitation of the labor of others, or on kinds of work that can only count as such within a miserable mode of production. Secondly, not enough means of production are produced to allow the whole potential working population to work under the most productive conditions, so that their absolute labor time is curtailed by the mass and effectiveness of the constant capital applied during this labor time. Periodically, however, too much is produced in the way of means of labor and means of subsistence, too much to function as means for exploiting the workers at a given rate of profit. Too many commodities are produced for the value contained in them, and the surplus value included in this value to be realized under the conditions of distribution given by capitalist production, and to be transformed back into new capital. That is, it is impossible to accomplish this process without ever recurrent explosions. It is not that too much wealth is produced, but from time to time, 
too much wealth is produced in its capitalist, antagonistic forms. The barriers to the capitalist mode of production show themselves as follows. 1. In the way that the development of labor productivity involves a law, in the form of the falling rate of profit, that at a certain point confronts this development itself in a most hostile way and has constantly to be overcome by way of crises. 2. In the way that it is the appropriation of unpaid labor, and the proportion between this unpaid labor and objectified labor in general, to put it in capitalist terms, profit and the proportion between this profit and the capital applied, that is, a certain rate of profit. It is this that determines the expansion or contraction of production, instead of the proportion between production and social needs, the needs of socially developed human beings. Barriers to production, therefore, arise already at a level of expansion which appears completely inadequate from the other standpoint. Production comes to a standstill not at the point where needs are satisfied, but rather where the production and realization of profit impose this. It's worthwhile to interject here that Marx does not think that human needs are static. And if capital formation were to fall exclusively into the hands of a few existing big capitals for whom the mass of profit outweighs the rate, the animating fire of production would be totally extinguished. It would die out. It is the rate of profit that is the driving force in capitalist production, and nothing is produced save what can be produced at a profit. Hence the concern of the English economists over the decline in the profit rate. If Ricardo is disquieted even by the very possibility of this, that precisely shows his deep understanding of the conditions of capitalist production. What other people reproach him for, that is, that he is unconcerned with human beings and concentrates exclusively on the development of the productive forces when considering capitalist production, whatever sacrifices of human beings and capital values this is bought with, this is precisely his significant contribution. The development of the productive forces of social labor is capital's historic mission and justification. For that very reason, it unwittingly creates the material conditions for a higher form of production. What is visible here in a purely economic manner, that is, from the bourgeois standpoint, within the limits of capitalist understanding, from the standpoint of capitalist production itself, are its barriers, its relativity, the fact that it is not an absolute but only a historical mode of production, corresponding to a specific and limited epoch in the development of the material conditions of production. <laughs> Now, such necessities don't necessarily cause things to happen. Visit patreon.com slash Ashley A. Frawley for part two.